Zoll Technology will guide you to meet the 2015 CPR guidelines. High quality resuscitation on the move is achievable and high perfusion CPR is within reach. When it comes to helping you deliver high quality CPR, no one offers you more than Zoll. Thank you very much. So uh, I'm going to be talking about research. And firstly, I'd like to know my audience. How many of you work in ED, uh, emergency department? Yeah. How many of you uh, are from Singapore? Marvelous. Any Australians? Hello, marvelous. Okay, good. Super. I quite like to ask questions, okay? So sometimes I will ask questions. I don't mind what the answer is. It's just for fun, okay? So let's take it on. There won't be many. This is me. I don't have, unfortunately, any financial interests. And my daughter says, Ian's daddy smiling again. He must be doing something for free. So that's not good. That's where I work. It's near Oxford Street. This is the sort of department that there is. Um, very mixed. And these are some of the common presentations. And I put cardiac arrest in red because it doesn't happen every day, does it, ladies and gentlemen? But it happens on a frequent enough basis that it's important. And that's why I got sort of involved in uh, resuscitation type of work. And it's a really important message as well in that most kids are fine, aren't they? Most are OK. Sometimes the problem is about how we practice our medicine on those children. And so they think it's weird, some of the stuff we do, like management of bronchiolitis, there's no evidence that anything works other than giving them a nice little cuddle and maybe some paracetamol as well. Okay, so this is what we're going to do. We're going to just very quickly cover aspects about the task force, look at one of the uh, PICO questions, um, which my psychotherapist says I'm getting better on over now, and I can show you why later on, and just about research itself, why more research needs to be done. And that's been touched on already by Dr. DeCan. So this is the group, again, we emphasize this, it's multidisciplinary, involves everyone, including the RCA. And uh, I must say that the people who've been recognized here, we should mention KC, for example, who used to get up at 4 a.m. to do telephone calls. 4 a.m. is the worst time for any human being. And poor Jean was also subjected uh, to psychological danger by involvement in this process. Lots of other people who are behind as well took place, took part in this. Um, so why? Why do research? Why science? Isn't just the experience that you have enough? So from this blogging website, for example, you can see there's something innate in us. We like stories. Stories are easier for us to grasp. Um, we're social storytelling animals. We learn from experience. My friend ate a plant with bright red berries and then was ill. Don't eat that plant, dummy, yes? Don't get a fever, because then you might die. And people worry about dying. They worry about the children dying. Maybe it's bubonic plague. Maybe it's hemorrhagic dengue. People worry about things on the basis of maybe little information. We try and make a mental shortcut, almost for survival, from an evolutionary point of view. Because you can't, if you're running around in your loincloth, wait for the RCT that shows whether or not you should eat that berry or nay. And so this is important, but it's important also that we have science when we're making big decisions. And here's, here's a, a lovely example. Um, so this, was, this is a lady who was a dispatcher, yeah? And, what, and she's recorded some of the things that people have said to her. Now, can you always believe what people say to you? Can you always believe the evidence that you're given? For example, this call here. <laughs> how true is this? So, how much research is there in the world? How much research is there? Is there a lot? Is there a little? What do you think? Who thinks that there's been more than, say, uh, 400,000 publications that are recorded in PubMed? from the beginning of time? More or less? 400,000. Hands up, more, hands less. More, less? OK. Well, you're wrong. Um, <laughs> so here, we've got 600,000. The first one was in, eight, in uh, 1861, uh, which was about the formation of the Clinical Investigation Society for the Royal Society of Medicine, which was going to look at the use of things like arsenic in the treatment of dropsy. So maybe not directly relevant today, and maybe we've evolved some of our medical procedures. But down here at the bottom then, so that's the blue one, is the total number of research papers. And this here is adult resuscitation. That is 10,000. So you see it's almost flat lining, even now. And when you go to the pediatrics versus adults, well, this is, this is that adult resuscitation line. 
and this is the Peds line. So there's still a big difference. And this is one of the reasons why it's a call to arms. And obviously it's about paediatrics, because adults are not interesting at all. But so you can see why we need to have more. And that's what Alan sort of put too about the limited number of cases that there actually are. Sorry, going the wrong way. Okay, so we start from a very poor baseline. This is a lovely photo in 1910 of a school teacher teaching children how to swim in a playground. Okay. So we're at the very early outset. You haven't got water. So you have to adapt. How much does the adaptation that we have from extrapolation of adult data, of animal data, fit to this? And this is one of the things that we're always worrying about, aren't we, about what's the meaning? Can you swim properly by this technique or not? Well, it's better than doing nothing. And of course, within the science that there is, there's the science of belief here. The belief in the scientific process that we have, it's almost ingrained into us. And that multiplied by the educational theory and the local implementation, should give rise to increased survival. That's the whole point of our activities. And Karl Popper was a very famous uh, Austro-British philosopher, and this is worth a read. It is heavy going, but it's a really um, substantial book called The Logic of Scientific Discovery. And he said that you can refute an idea, a hypothesis, but you can't <coughs> prove it. That's on the back of Francis Bacon, who's obviously a bit older, 1620, who had a process of what's called inductivism. That's to say, uh, you take an idea and you keep saying, well, there doesn't seem to be anything else to change it, so it must be right. It must be right. It must be right. And there's a sort of a difference, a significant difference, in that you're, from the more modern point of view, Karl Popper, you're trying to say, it adheres in this circumstance, but I can't say it's guaranteed 100%. Now, how does that accord with what we do at the moment? So just to illustrate, uh, Bacon would say, all swans are white, because he's seen all white swans. Popper would say, well, that disproves it. So that disproves the theory. But how does this relate to our practice? Because we don't know if there are white swans or not. We don't know if there's a black swan. So that is difficult for us as emergency physicians um, to be able to have that sort of remote world of looking at things. Because we have to take the patients who come to us and say, if you've got petechiae, if you've got fever, if you've got tachycardia, in the UK, it's much more likely to be meningococcal, streptococcal, central virus, than dengue fever. I work at St. Mary's, though, so every couple of years, because it's at the end of the Heathrow Express, straight off the airplane, we get dengue. And we get visceral uh, cutaneous leishmaniasis which is, of course, not endemic in the UK. So the prevalences in our decision-making has to be guided also by other factors, and that's coming back to the survival formula, how important it is putting the context of the science and how we look at that science. So beliefs and science, okay? So uh, this is why I again want to interact with you. So roller skates compared to a roller coaster, yeah? Everyone been on a roller skate? Everyone been on a roller coaster? No, oh, there's some no's. Okay. So, which one is more dangerous? How many more people die with roller skating? How many more people die with a roller coaster? Which one is the one that potentially you should avoid? Right, roller skates. Any roller coasters? So, this is your belief principle. Do you have the evidence to support what you are saying? Or is this a belief structure that you have? It's a belief structure. Okay, and this is important. This is important. It's like the arsenic and the dropsy, if you see what I mean, from 1861. Okay, what about this? So this is to illustrate. This is here. This is an island. And that thing there is a shark. Okay? This is an island, and there are no more sharks. But there are coconut trees. Yeah, you can see coconut trees, yes? So what is more dangerous? Do more people die here because of sharks do more people die because of coconut trees <laughs> what's the answer tell me so shark hands up for more people die with sharks hands up more people die from being helped by coconuts okay so those are your belief structures okay i'm going to hold you to those because that's important now what about these who here has taken part in doing pediatric cpr Hands up all those who've been involved in doing cardiac arrest management on children. 
OK, fine. So these are things that you probably do do, yes? And you, is the science good for these things? Yes or no? Who puts their hands up say, yes, it's good? Who puts their hands up, no? Yes? No? I mean, these are things you do. <laughs> you do these things, don't you? You get up in the morning and you put your shoes on and you put, your, you put on some uh, garments because you think it might rain today because you've been told it might rain today. And you have a belief looking out because there's rain outside that it's going to carry on raining. So you do this. So you have some sort of information. You're doing this practice. So who here thinks that there's good evidence for doing this? OK, fine. That's fine. You can be not sure as well. But don't forget, you're practicing this every day, every time you're doing CPR. OK, I'll come back to that later on. So this is the grade. That's what it stands for. And it's been going around quite a long time. And it was a big thing for us, I think, to take on in ILCOR as a different way of looking at systematic reviews for outcomes. And again, you've seen these slides a well, while, but I just want to emphasize the difference that there is between RCT and observational studies, which is difficult because RCTs are costly and timely and take, don't always give you the answer. And these are the things, again, that lower the quality of evidence, the indirectness for example, I'm, this is, um, I should say, these are Alan's slides, thank you. But just to highlight about adult studies apply to children, as I said, uh, in the school ground, the playground activity, how reproducible is that, and then also small samples and wide confidence intervals. And sometimes, you know, when you try and get involved in RCTs, you just can't help it. Things spring up. So this is Heliox. Now, um, nitrogen, you know, 71% nitrogen in the air, yeah? They replace the nitrogen with helium. Nitrogen's 14 is its molecular weight. Helium's 2, so it's much lighter, so you should get better dispersal through. So we had the study where we wanted to try and use bronchiolitis kids with tight facial CPAP in the ED to try and prevent intubation to see whether or not they would be better off with heliox than with just sort of um, slightly increased oxygen concentration. Guess what we forgot? What happens when you take helium on board? And what happens when you put a facial mask on a young baby? They start crying, yes? So it was very difficult to blind them because the ordinary group went, wah, 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 and the other group went, <laughs> So when sometimes things just happen, and that indirectness doesn't validate that study. And I say that against myself. It was very funny. Although a lot of people were very, very fed up <laughs> in terms of the blinding. <laughs> Coming back to this then, again, the recommendations. And it's about the utility, the science to the utility. Yeah, the science to the utility. And it does change. So I'm going to look now at one particular question uh, which caused us great consternation, as many of them did, which was about targeted temperature management. And this was the PICO, the P-I-C-O. The setting, the use of targeted temperature management against normothermia. Uh, hospital discharge, length of stay. And I'm going to not read through these. I'm going to show you the depth to which we analysed the papers that there were. And the reason why we had to do that, this is one of the four papers, is that the numbers are tiny. And that's what I'm going to point out to you in red, 70. This is for the use of targeted temperature management in children post-cardiac arrest, a big deal. Financially, a big deal, a big requirement, a lot of service, a lot of resource. Does it make a difference? Does it improve outcomes? And that's what we wanted to know. Here is another observational study. 181 patients, no protocol, no definite uh, entry criteria, retrospective study. So some guys liked doing it, and some people didn't like doing it. So inconsistency, and you'll see that in a moment. Lynn, single center children's study, uh, and this was 62 patients. So these are not big numbers, because they're the total but in comparison. And this is the one that we waited for for a long time, which is the Thapka out-of-hospital cardiac arrest. Again, the numbers here are not big. This was 260. Took a long time to get and cost a lot of dollars. And don't forget, those dollars may prevent other studies from being done, because we're resource-limited in terms of time and capability. And these are the grade tables. I will just flick through these for you. So these are the different types of studies here. The study design, observation, as you can see. And these are the different types of bias. Very serious because they're observational. Uh, inconsistency, uh, no problem there because it was the right sort of group. And the in, in uh, directness, well, it 
the, it was the group we wanted to do imprecision about y confidence intervals and so on, other considerations. And these actually are the numbers in the group, as you can see, for each one of those different questions, length of stay, length of stay, and so on, and survival basis here. And then what, how good were they at the distinguishing elements? I won't dwell too much on it, but you can see you're making big decisions on really small numbers. And again, this was um, similarly here, and this is where the FAPCA one at the bottom is the randomized control trial survival at one year. FAPCA out of hospital. There's in hospital is going to be reporting later on. Relative risk 1.22, but the confidence interval is 0 0.86 to 1.75. So you may improve 54 uh, patients to have targeted temperature management, but the range is from having an adverse effect on 34 to improving up to 185. So what do you do? It's difficult. It's difficult. And you have to be really careful about how you analyze this data. So this, we suggest that for infants and children with out-of-hospital cardiac arrest, it's used in the post-cardiac arrest period. It's unknown exactly what, because they weren't tested for the duration or the age range, but it might be that you're okay with this or you're okay with this, but it's a weak recommendation. For survivors of in-hospital cardiac arrest, what we had was so low that you couldn't say anything. And that's why it's written up so clearly about the values and preferences to try and explain the difficulties that there are for people looking at the science to say what you can or can't do. Okay. This decision was based on the fact that while the SUPCA study did not show success, it was underpowered. And again, this took a lot of money. And the lower 95th confidence interval approach won, but the kaplan meier shirves showed a tendency towards better outcomes at the lower temperature ages. What was clear, though, was that hypothermia is an adverse thing. And even those children who were <coughs> kept with enormous thermia often had to be cooled to normal thermia. So there's a bit of bias there as well. Insufficient data for uh, in-hospital cardiac patients because there may be a different population, and also the resources. And these resources, because we're trying to do global guidelines, it's, you've got to be able to get the expertise, to have the skills, the system for maintaining this, and there may be sedation, analgesia, and neuromuscular blockade. So there's a lot in terms of consideration of the science and the utility of the science based on small research numbers. So, oops, damn. So I asked you about the roller coaster, yes, and you said that roller skates were worse, okay? So according to the US uh, 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 consumer <coughs> products, there were 52 deaths, which roughly works out at 3.7 deaths per year. Okay? This is fact. Okay? That's fact. Of the 36 who died since 1992, 31 collide with a motor vehicle accident, that gives a figure of six deaths per year. So you are right. So your instinctive idea, because I don't think you had the science, did you? Did you? Well, maybe there might be some geeks, but they're sad. So you had that data. But what about the other one, though? Because you were equally clear about coconuts and sharks, <laughs> weren't you? You said what? Coconuts. More coconuts, yes? Is there an evidence? So sharks. I'm getting confused now. Sharks, hands up. Coconuts, hands up. OK, it's more coconuts. More coconuts win, OK? Is there an evidence base for this? There is insufficient data. This is an urban myth. It comes from, oh, so sorry, sorry. It, come, it comes from an urban myth. It comes from an urban myth in that one person took, or reported on a local patch that there had been 30 deaths from coconuts. Extrapolated that to say there was going to be globally 150, which was just on the basis of pulling a figure out of the air. There is not a mortality register about coconut deaths. <laughs> OK? So you don't know. But again, your belief structure was such that you wanted to go, coconuts are bad. <laughs> really important. So our beliefs may be wrong. And that's one of the things we have to do. That's why we have to be inquisitive. We have to use research in a structured way. So all these things that you do on a daily basis, well, hopefully not on a daily basis, but for CPR, I hope not. You have a belief structure. Do you have a scientific basis for it? Is there a strong scientific basis for it? 
Well, these are things that I've adapted simply from that list that was shown to you already. So you've already been told by one speaker that there is no evidence for this. So implementation is really important. So you've been told already, but you still might go ahead. We have to bang our heads against, this is a fantastic picture of, a, of um, this was an assessment of an early NFL helmet. This was how they tested this helmet to see whether or not it was good enough to use in American football. So methodology of research may change with time as well. But again, what you're doing, you're doing on the basis of not strong scientific evidence. So there are areas for research. And um, those people who are here in the opening address, Jerry Nolan gave a very, very good talk. And he said that there were these areas. These are all areas for research. There are also additional areas. And that is people research. Why people do what they do, why they don't do what they do, how we can implement. And it's not just healthcare professionals, it will be bystanders, you know, you're hearing it time and time again because it's so important. Why is in some cultures people will not do mouth to mouth? Because it could be quite difficult for you to do that. Uh, that's why personally I always carry around a face mask so that I could do it. Because actually going up to a stranger and doing it might otherwise be quite difficult. But I've removed that sort of step away and I'd suggest that you do as well. Uh, depending on what Jerry says about adults. And again, I don't care about adults. <laughs> but there's also the thing about bystanders. Yep, so bystanders are high up on the list. Because in order to improve things, as I say, you've got to have the medicine, the science, the research, the belief in what you're doing. And you're doing stuff that actually there isn't great science for. But the more research, then you can define that about the efficiency of teaching that, about how it's implemented and how you improve survival because you want outcomes that look at this, okay? So do you want to be at point A, point B, point C in terms of how likely it is you're on these different curves? So some people will accept the cardiac survival and there's devastation neurological output, moderate neurological problems or completely intact. And these are sort of deals in some respects we have to make amongst ourselves and with the public. So, and the research should lead to implementation of better CPR by bystanders, by all of us, and it should be child's play. Like this. Douglas, my son, who did this spontaneously without any coaching, um, <laughs> which, which worries me a lot because... <laughs> I shouldn't have dummies like this at home anyway, but there you go. This technique isn't too bad. Okay, thank you so much for listening.